everybody today we have the lecture number 11 and it's time to finish the chapter about climate change in this lecture i want to summarize the effects of climate change on our future and i want to talk about climate change deniers because there are still people around which somehow have a problem with the discussion of climate change so let's discuss the main effect of climate change the maybe most important effect is not directly the climate change in air but let's say a kind of climate change in the oceans because as we have learned in the previous lectures the cause of the climate change is the burning of fossil fuels which increases co2 in the atmosphere then we have greenhouse effect and global warming but there's a second effect which is maybe even more important because the CO2 from fossil fuels goes not only into the atmosphere but also into the ocean. So you have the chemical reaction as you know from previous lectures already that the CO2 plus water produces an acidification of the oceans. What does it mean? Well normally the ocean is basic as chemists say when it becomes less and less basic it becomes more and more acid and this is now happening since about 200 years on this map here you see the change of the ph value over the last about 200 years and the scale is as follows if it would be white or pink nothing would have changed there's no area in the ocean where this is the case instead we have areas with more or less change of the pH value. So this shows you there is something happening. So you cannot neglect that. These are measurements. And what is actually happening? Well, you see it on the diagram here. The CO2 goes into the water. As we have learned last time, it produces CO3 ions, which change the equilibrium of those ions in the water which has big effects on a lot of organisms and secondly it, it there are more H plus ions which means the ocean is more acid. Those two effects directly work on especially those organisms in the ocean which are calcifying which means that they have structures they are made out of structures of calcium carbonate and calcium carbonate as i explained you last time if you put a strong acid in it dissolves completely but even less acidification makes it vulnerable to the dissolution and some examples of those animals are corals foraminifera echinoderms crustaceans mollusks and so on. I don't know all these English expressions for these animals, but of course all of them are basic animals in the sea which are the start of the food chain for the other animals and therefore the acidification can have a big effect on our future food chain which takes its beginning in the oceans. Now I come to the second effect of climate change, the global warming. That is what we normally associate with the climate change. Here the diagram, you also know it already. The experimental data from the last 20, 30, 40 years obviously show that the global average surface temperature on the Earth is rising. This rise is a fraction of a degree Celsius or it's about one degree Celsius, so it's not that dramatic on the first view, but actually it has a big effect on our future, especially because it won't stop here, it will continue whatever we do. The distribution of the temperature increase is not the same everywhere on the world. And on the map here you see it hits Africa, it hits Australia, it hits South America, and especially it hits the Arctic region in the very north. Uh, temperature is rising a lot. So already in the last 50 years it changed by about 4 degrees Celsius, which is already a lot. 
and we come back to that. So the question now is how will it continue in the coming years? As you know, the reason for the global warming is the burning of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels produce CO2. CO2 is a greenhouse gas. The greenhouse gas makes a greenhouse effect and therefore it becomes warmer. And with this input, scientists can calculate by simulation of the Earth system how it will continue in the coming years. So on the upper plot here, you see the prediction of the scientists about what will be in the year 2019. That is a time when the young children today are old. And assuming that we drop significantly down to zero the CO2 emission until the year 2080, which is in 60 years from now. And you see the rise of temperature will be mostly below 2 degrees Celsius. That is what the aim of the IPPC is. And this will in principle just still work except for the northern areas where due to the melting of the ice the temperature effect is much larger. What happens if we continue with our emission of fossil fuels? The emission is going up all the time. So if we triple that until 2080, you get the lower plot here, the lower map of the Earth. And you see the temperature rise is in the average 3 or 4 degrees Celsius and sometimes up to about 6 degrees Celsius. So this as you can imagine, will be a disaster for our civilization. The effect of global warming is shown here in the next picture. The main effects of global warming are heat waves, are droughts, forest fires and desertification. It's quite natural, it's all very logically because if it gets warmer, there will be more heat waves, stronger heat waves. There will be in certain areas no rain, so there will be droughts. There will be uh, hot weather with little rain. This, of course, will have mainly as a first thing effects on agriculture and of course also on the people. They won't have enough to eat. They won't have enough to drink. And then, of course, nature reacts to it. The first thing we see are forest fires. We have seen that in the last years. There have been big fires in Australia recently. There have been big fires in Brazil recently. And uh, like one or two years ago, there were big fires in Siberia in the northern areas of the world. So we see it everywhere. and. From the physics point of view, of course, it's clear if it's getting warmer and drier, things burn more easily. In those areas where there are a lot of trees still, they will just burn down. The same happened in California and everywhere in the world, also in Europe, in Spain, in Portugal. Everywhere there were a lot of forest fires in the last years. The next step then in those areas where there is continuously little rain, what happens is desertification, so the areas which were still green, like in certain zones in Africa, for example, um, there the vegetation will go back and desertification is starting. One problem always here is that in case the ground is dry and it rains, the rain will just flow away and will not be sucked up in the ground so that even the rain which is falling in those deserted areas uh, will not stay but instead produce floods. The next important effect on global warming is in those areas where there has been since hundreds of years permafrost or bet let's better say since almost a million of years. In this permafrost regions the soil gets melted, it gets soft, buildings, pipelines and all kinds of things will become unstable, which is a big problem for these areas. But concerning the climate, the worst effect of course is 
that when the ground is melting, there's a lot of methane coming out. Where does the methane come from? Well, a long time ago, these areas were not permafrost re regions, and in this time, there's been a lot of vegetation in the grounds, but now, after hundreds of thousands of years, the vegetation and the bacteria which are in the ground, when they get warmer now, produce methane, and this methane goes into the atmosphere, and as we learned, the methane is a strong greenhouse gas and it produces a lot of additional global warming. So this is one of the tipping points which has a strong positive feedback on the global warming effect. The next effect which goes to the even colder region is the melting of ice and snow as well in the Himalaya and in the Alps. But especially, of course, in the Arctis and Antarctis. As you know, the Arctis is swimming, so if the ice in the Arctis melts due to global warming, it has no effect on the sea level. This is something you learn in physics, that if you melt ice, the level of the water does not change. So it's not a problem on the sea level, but of course, it is a problem for two reasons. One is that a lot of sweet water goes into the ocean, which changes the balance of salts, and therefore the ocean currents are changed. And secondly, it changes the albedo of the, uh, of the Earth, which means that the Earth is less reflecting, and the Earth reflects less of the sunlight because the snow is gone, then it becomes warmer, so this is also a positive feedback effect on global warming. The next effect on global warming is that tropical storms become stronger. So there are cyclones, there are hurricanes, tornadoes, all kind of these strong winds. And they become stronger because the ocean is warmer, the earth is warmer. And because it's warmer, there's more humidity, there's more water vapor in the air. And this all together makes this cyclones stronger and we have seen that in the recent years so there are much more strong cyclones across the areas which have these tropical storms and the destruction of that is immense we have seen that in all the relevant continents this destruction of course causes problems to the society but also to agriculture and to drinking water so these are the basic elementary effects of global warming. And now I come to number three. It's not only that the Earth becomes warmer, but it's also that the atmospheric circulations change and also the ocean currents change. Why is that? Well, one reason, for example, is that the North and South Poles are not as cold anymore, so there's less gradient and then there are less stronger winds. And in general, the circulations of the air and of the water on the globe is a very complicated system and it's driven by temperatures, temperature differences between different areas on the globe and um, if this is changed, the whole system is changed. In detail, the circulations are quite complex. It's much related also to the Coriolis forces, which are acting on the globe because the Earth is rotating around its axis. So in detail, it's a complicated stuff. But what you have to remember from it that due to global warming, the climate patterns are changing changing of climate pattern is not only bad for tourism, but it's uh, very bad for plants and agriculture because in different areas of climate there are different types of plants. And if this is changing fast, then the nature cannot adapt so fast anymore. The ground is different, the types of plants are different, and the whole ecosystem is different in different climate regions. 
So these fast changes are really a problem. The other effect of global warming is that the jet streams change, that they sometimes become less strong and that means that the movement of the clouds uh, becomes in certain areas slower. So if there's an area of rain, it takes longer for the rain to pass to another area. If there's snow, the same. If there's a very stable weather pattern with hot and clear air, and this stays longer there, then in this area there's less rain than typically. So the duration of periods of drought and rain typically uh, become longer, which is of course a problem also mainly to agriculture. The effect of global warming in this respect of course is very different in different areas on the globe. The big climate system which is related to monsoon uh, changes also and this can have really huge impact on whole continents. Another example is the El Nino system in the southern Pacific. Also there are changes due to the circulation of the ocean currents. So all these things start to change when the global temperature is changing. And therefore we can expect a lot of small effects which you can only understand if you re do really deep detailed calculations of that. So this I think we should leave to the climate scientist. We can just observe that already today those things are happening. Here are some examples when there is rain and the rain is stronger and takes longer. Then you get a flooding which is again a big problem. Or if there is a good weather period like we had in Germany two years ago and this nice weather is warm and dry, you get a drought and you get immediately problems with agriculture and the agricultural output, which again can lead finally to hunger and migration. Here another example for the ocean currents. So this shows you the North Atlantic circulation. The North Atlantic circulation, also called the Gulf Stream, is very important for the weather in Europe, also for part of North America. And this Gulf Stream brings us warm water from Africa to Europe. And that is the reason why, for example, the Mediterranean area, but also France and Germany have so nice weather all the time. So what could happen to the Gulf Stream? Well, there are calculations. We know nowadays that the Gulf Stream is mainly driven by evaporation of the water in the northern area of the Atlantic, close to the Arctic. And due to the melting of the water, the salt concentration changes, the temperature gradients are changing, and there are calculations which predict that the Gulf Stream, when this, what is called this pump, in the Arctic is stopping, then also stops or becomes slower. It depends on a lot of circumstances if this really will be the case, but if it's the case, it's a tipping point which has huge effect on the climate in Europe and parts of North America. So then we better go back into our calves because like the people after the last ice age, they also um, had to protect themselves against this strong cold winters. Why do I tell you this? Well, you should understand that climate change leads to global warming, but global warming is not necessarily the case in all scenario and in all areas of the earth. It could be areas in the world which become much, much colder depending on all these parameters of the world. But in general, of course, all calculations show that finally the climate system will mainly lead to global warming. So now we talked about acidification of the oceans, we talked about global warming and we 
talked about more extreme weather conditions. The next effect of fossil fuel burning is the rising of the sea level. This is of course again an indirect effect of global warming. We have seen that especially uh, in the North and South Pole temperatures were rising. The South Pole is still quite stable because there's so much ice on it. But of course, sooner or later, the warmer it becomes, the more ice will melt. And we see this melting and breaking off of these glaciers in the Antarctica already. We observe that already today. Now we come again to data. So this shows you the change of the sea level due to the melting of glaciers. And we see and we see that in the last about 40 years, the sea level has been rising by more than 25 centimeter. So this is already something which you can see at the coast in a way, if you do measurement averaging of the tides. This effect will be much stronger in future. So if you look at the rising curve, there's no hint that it will saturate. And of course, also from calculation, we know that if temperature is rising, more and more ice is melting. If the ice in Greenland, for example, melts, you can calculate the amount of water in this ice and you find out that the sea level will rise by seven meters. And if the whole Antarctica is melting, the sea rise level will be 60 meters. So this is consistent which what we have seen in the first lectures that during the last ice ages the sea level changed by about 100 meters so the remaining ice on the Antarctica and in Greenland changes another 67 meters. This of course will not happen in the next five years but it's surprising how fast sea level is rising and how fast temperature is increasing. If you talk about Antarctica, you normally think about a deep freeze basically, but actually this year in February, they had already up to 20 degrees in Antarctica in, at the South Pole. And this is really not how you think the South Pole should be. Looking in the internet, I found this nice picture here. So it really even was in the news that there was an, that there was a record temperature in the Antarctica. What is wrong in this picture? Well, probably not many of you have been on at the South Pole, but certainly you will not find ice bears there. So please remember ice bears are around the North Pole and around the South Pole there are penguins. Yeah? North Pole and South Pole are very different in this respect. So don't believe everything that you see in the internet. Last year I've been given a talk about climate change at the University of Bremen. And there they pointed out a very nice simulation program to me, which all of you can use just to get a feeling about what sea level rise means. So the link for the simulation tool you find here on this picture. So just try it for the area where you come from. It works, I guess, for the whole globe. So now let's play with it. So you see here is Bremen. Bremen is a very nice town. It's close to Hamburg. Hamburg is further on the right. Both very nice towns where I have been in the past. And what happens now, you see in the north, there is the North Sea. And what happens after sea rise? Well, if we rise it by seven meters, so if the whole Greenland ice is melted, what happens to the area in Germany? Well, unfortunately, most of Bremen is underwater. So some buildings of Bremen will still look out of the sea like an island, but all the surrounding is flooded. 
What happens if also the Antarctica is melting? Well, you add 60 meters. Unfortunately, not only Bremen disappears, but also Hamburg. Hamburg is gone. Another nice town is Cologne. That is the area where I originally come from. Um, it's not on the map here anymore. It's down in the south and even that is affected by the sea level. Fortunately, my university here in Gießen has no problems. We are high enough above sea ground that there is no problem for this town. But of course, if you look into other areas of our world, there are lots of islands which will disappear. There are countries like Bangladesh or so, uh, which also will have big problems, even if the sea rise level is only very much less than this seven meters, for example. So what I showed you here are the four basic main effects of climate change, of fossil fuels. Now the last one which I want to discuss are socio-economical and political effects. And this, of course, is much more complex and I will not have the time to discuss that in any depth. I just want to show you an example. Um, you all know already the picture here, which is one of these pictures I show in all my lectures. What is it about? Well, it's about what we could call an anthropogenic natural disaster. This happened in the 1930s in the center of the United States, in the big plains. What happened there? Well, there were big dust storms and they covered everything with dust and sand and soil and all the agriculture did not work suddenly anymore and um, people had to move. This was a big dust bowl and you could say this is something which happens naturally. You can't do anything about it, but actually it's also anthropogenic. So what happens there a long time before, since probably thousands of years, this area has been steppe. There were bisons or buffaloes and there were the Native Americans living there and everything was in some kind of equilibrium. Then those people which we call Americans nowadays, so the European people came there, they killed the bisons, they killed a lot of the Native Americans. By the way, a lot of them were killed by epidemics which they got from the new American people and they changed the land. They made agriculture in those fields. But the way of agriculture they did didn't fit to the areas. The buffaloes, which were important for the ground and for the steppe there to keep everything in an equilibrium, were not there anymore. And then there was erosion and then there was this dust bowl. What happens now from the socio-economical aspect? Well, people did not have anything to eat anymore. They didn't have anything to work in this area, so they migrated. So the migrants, they went, for example, to California. And this is a picture from this time. Family is broken in a way. The baby is sick. The car has troubles. This is the fate of people who have to migrate. At these times, of course, there was California and it's a great country and uh, people got a new home in California and they had a prosperous life there afterwards. So what does it have to do with climate change? Well, climate change starts with tornadoes, with cyclones, with floods, with heat waves. So you will have disasters. In some areas you have droughts. Agriculture will stop working properly. There will be hunger. There will be new diseases because of changed temperatures. Today we have overpopulation and a large, a very large inequality. There will be more unemployment and this leads to migration, either because you don't have enough to eat or because you are looking for a better life or for a job somewhere. If 
climate change becomes more strongly, you will have breakdowns of economies, you might have civil wars, you might also have real wars between leaders of different parts of the world. People say this happened already in the past. For example, the war in Syria is one of those examples which has a lot of components from climate change, from drought and from agricultural failure in these areas. But this is not the time now to discuss those things in more detail. So we see climate change has a huge effect not only on biodiversity, not only on nature, but especially of course on our civilization. And if it will be the end of our civilization as we know it today, this is up to us. And it's clear that life on earth will not stop because of climate change. But there might of course be a mass extinction and life in hundred or thousand years will be completely different and it will recover maybe in hundred thousand years in a completely different way. But this is not our direct future. Let's think about the direct future which is the next hundreds of years. And now I come to the problem of climate change deniers. Climate change deniers on different levels played a very important role in the last 50 years and especially in the last 20 years, I would say. And there are different types of climate change deniers and I would like to distinguish in the following way. First of all, there are people who say climate is not changing. It always changes a little bit, but there's no significant climate change which we have to be afraid of. Then there's a second type of people who say climate is changing. Of course, we see temperature rise, we see sea level rise, we see storms and extreme weather conditions. But this is nature. There's no way to do anything about it. And this is not due to fossil fuels. It is just the way nature goes. And you just have to pray to God and then everything will be fine, for example. Those two kind of climate change deniers um, to me are at the similar level like the people who say um, the earth is flat. And um, if you talk to them, there's no really, there's really no way to change their opinion about that. And it's also not our task to change their opinion. There's always somebody who thinks somebody which does not really make sense. Yeah, it's the same level as to a child you say there's Santa Claus distributing presents on one night everywhere in the world. This is a similar level of understanding the world and you don't have to worry about those people normally. When I teach basic physics, I always like to take the following example. When I was younger, there were people who were very esoteric and they said, well, if you really strongly believe, you can walk through walls, for example. Yeah? There are people on the world who are able to walk through walls and you just have to really believe it and then it will work. Yeah, And then you try and it doesn't work and you say, no, it's wrong. But those people will always tell you, well, it's because you didn't really believe in it. And from the physics point of view, of course, um, you have radiation which goes through walls like neutrons easily go through walls, neutrinos even more easily, but even x-rays can go through walls. So there's no real reason why people should not be able to walk through walls. And then I always say, well, just try it, try it hundred times, try it thousand times. The laws of nature uh, will not depend on what you think about them. They are just there and there's no way around them. Yeah, They don't care about you and they exist. And if the community of scientists comes to a conclusion about something, you can really trust it and you must really be very clever to find a way to alter that. So on this level, I just tell them, well, try, but you will not succeed. So these two kind of people mostly don't understand the real physics. But of course, most people don't understand it really. But the problem is 
they don't accept the scientific arguments and they have some kind of belief behind it which you just cannot change and you don't have to change it. But now come to the third type of climate change deniers and this is much more important for us. What is the third type of climate change deniers? Well, I call them the implicit climate change deniers. And I would say these are people who have either a willful decision not to act. So there are people who say, well, yes, somehow I know that there is climate change. I know that it will be a disaster, but I have decided not to act. I will neglect it and I will do as if there is nothing happening. So this is a willful act and people believe they are free and are allowed to do that. The other type of climate change denial is much closer. What most of the people are, most of the honest people are, they also believe that there is a problem that in principle one would have to do something, but one doesn't take it for real and one just neglects it because it gives you a bad feeling if you think about climate change all the time. So this is a kind of mental dissociation from the problem we have. So they act as if there's nothing, but in reality, somewhere deep inside of them, they know we have a problem. If you think about it as a scientist, you could say, well, it does not matter which kind of climate change denier you are. If you inside of you really know it or don't know it or understand it or don't understand it, as long as you don't act, then it has no effect on the outside world. So it doesn't matter from this point of view. Once I would like to argue with the Bible, even there in the Bible and probably in every other religion, there are similar statements. The Bible says by their deeds and not by their words, you shall know them. Just look at what people do, how they live their life, and then you know if they are a climate change denier or not. This is of course very hard for most of us because it tells us that we are basically, most of us basically are climate change deniers in some sense. Yeah, there's nobody who could say to his children or to his grandchildren that he didn't know about it. There's for example here this nice film from the year 1958. So it's uh, a similar age than I have. So since I live, people knew already that there is a climate change and there is a problem of that. So let's just have a look into this nice movie here, just a few minutes. Even now, man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. Due to our release through factories and automobiles every year of more than six billion tons of carbon dioxide, which helps air absorb heat from the sun, our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. This is bad? Well, it's been calculated a few degrees rise in the Earth's temperature would melt the polar ice caps. And if this happens, an inland sea would fill a good portion of the Mississippi Valley. Tourists in glass-bottomed boats would be viewing the drowned towers of Miami through 150 feet of tropical water. Foreign weather, we're not only dealing with forces of a far greater variety than even the atomic physicist encounters, but with life itself. So, as we have seen in the film, it's all known since about 60 years. Everybody who is interested in this question knows it or could have known it. But now let's go to those which are responsible. For example, the companies where the business model is either to produce fossil fuel or to use it at large scale. What about them? Well, let's, let's take for example a company called... I guess you all have heard about them. There was for example a report, an internal report from, from the year 1982 where somebody calculated the effect of fossil fuels. So what is plotted here is 
the amount of CO2 over the years and what they expect what will happen in the next 20-30 years. Of course these companies are not stupid, they have in many cases the best engineers and the best scientists and they pay them a lot and then of course you also get good and right answers. So the answer was CO2 will be rising to a higher and higher level. They also calculated what the effect on the temperature, on the Earth's average temperature is, what we call the global warming nowadays. And they got results of a few tenths of degrees in the next decades. And if you look at the numbers, the prediction was basically correct. It was quite precise. So the companies knew about the global warming and the effects it has. So why for years did they deny that there is global warming due to fossil fuels? Well, the answer is simple. The job of the company and the job of the management is to make money. This is the general rule in our economy. And that's what they did. So if you know that your business model produces global warming and global warming is not accepted by the people, then of course part of your business model is to deny climate change. And that's what they did and that is what worked well for decades, for many decades until basically today. For me as a scientist this sounds strange and I'm a particle physicist and I was used to live in a community of people where they honestly try to understand the world and to get real answers. When I was more involved in the energy business, for me it was hard to realize that the people are lying all the time. Yeah? For me this was not how I was educated. But if you have more and more contact to people in these big businesses, up to the highest levels even in politics, it's very clear that a lot of the essential statements they do are complete lies, yeah? just because it's part of their business. And for some of them it's the only way to survive in their business. But of course it's not only the companies which are directly related to fossil fuels. It's basically our whole economy that does not take climate change seriously. Here's an example of a commercial. So it says we are global warming ready because of their short clothes, which might be funny for some people, but what is behind that? Well, first of all, climate change is not funny. It's not funny if the sea level is rising, like on this picture. And what does it show? It shows you these are all people of type 3 climate change deniers. They basically know about climate change. They make fun out of it. They know what happens. But still, psychologically, there's a disconnection. They are not afraid of it. They just neglect it in their daily life. I heard a talk from a psychologist some decades ago, which for me was very important to understand this kind of climate change denial. This person called it the risk thermostat. So every human being has a kind of risk thermostat, which tells the person if something is a danger or not if I have to be afraid of something or not, because there are so many things around us, so we have to select those things we really care about. So what did he say? He says there are certain risks where we are very sensitive, where we are very easily afraid of. And these are risks like that your house is burning, that you have accidents, that you have a heart attack. Of those things we are afraid of and we take care about those things in advance. So we have insurances against it, we have health insurance, car insurances, and so on. So what is specific of those things and why does it fail for the climate change? Before I come to the climate change, I want to compare the same way of thinking with what happened to the pandemic today. You know we have COVID-19 and people were surprised by that, that it has such a big impact on society. And people have the feeling there was no way to prepare for it. But actually, we know 
those coronaviruses since decades. We know there are labs experimenting with it. We know there is always a possibility that these viruses, which are in animals, go over to the human being. We also know that since decades, um, military is doing experiments with it, trying to use them as biological weapons, or at least trying to understand what you could do with it if the enemy would be making biological weapons out of it. We also know that these labs have accidents, and therefore there were many possibilities that at some point there is this COVID pandemic coming, and actually scientists were studying what happens if there's a pandemic as, for example, COVID, and scientists know about all these things, but the general public was not prepared. So what is this kind of implicit psychological denial? Well, for the standard person, a pandemic is not a threat or has not been a threat until a few months ago. Our risk thermostat tells us that there is a threat when things are visible. A virus is not visible. Also, the coming up of a pandemic was not visible in December, for example. Things which have a historical precedence, like wars and accidents and um, heart failures, they are a threat. Like my parents explained me how bad the Second World War was, so I was always afraid of the next war. For the pandemics, this is like 100 years ago and there's nobody living anymore who knows about the, la, the Spanish flu, for example. A risk thermostat works also when the response is immediately. If there's a car coming up to you, you are afraid and you know it crashes in a minute. But if the effect is drawn out, so if it takes weeks and months until you see an effect, um, it's much harder to see this correlation. So people talk about that uh, COVID is just a flu and people just didn't have the same effect. So it took them a long time until they realized all these body bags and coffins. And then they only saw what is happening out of it. And then it's very important for the risk thermostat to have a cause. And the cause has to be typically another type. If there's a war, or if there's a terrorist somewhere, it's those bad guys who are the risk, and that's why we are afraid of it. But, it. but if it's caused by nature, for example, like a virus expansion, um, then it's harder to go along with this risk. That's why some people say, oh, the bad people are the Chinese. But of course, it is not the Chinese the problem. It could as well come from the US or it could just come from nature. And the other point is, if it has direct personal impacts, it's easy to understand the threat. But if the impact is unpredictable and indirect, so if the virus affects people in Italy or in New York, but not, but I'm still happily alive, why should I wear a mask? Yeah. So there are many reasons why people deny threats and how they go along with them. Saying all that for the pandemic, I think to everybody it's clear that climate change is even more difficult in the sense. Climate change has been invisible only in the last few years. There are more and more direct signs. There's no historical precedence. The last ice age is too long ago as is that we have a personal relation to it. It's not immediate because it takes decades or maybe even 100 years to see all the effects. There's no simple causality. For many people, the greenhouse effect is something which is too complex for their own brain, so they can't understand it. Then, of course, there's no bad guy. Yeah? For some of us, it's the fossil fuel industry. For others, it's of course, the capitalism, but finally, we are all guilty. Yeah, we are all living as if there's no climate change. 
So we all have to change ourselves and this is more difficult to accept than if there's a bad terrorist somewhere in a foreign country who is responsible for that. And then of course climate change has no direct personal impacts. Well, it's not that you have personally to suffer if you drive a big car and you don't suffer if you drive a small car. So if you waste energy or you don't waste energy, this has no impact on the global climate. It's only that you are one of the contributors which are responsible. So in this sense, your personal impact is very indirect and doesn't affect you yourself. So that are all reasons why most of us are climate change deniers and they don't really see their own responsibility. Nevertheless, there have been scientists and people since decades which cared about global warming and climate effects. And I think the most prominent person currently, of course, is Greta Thunberg. This strong woman really took the effects how they are. She really feels personally concerned about climate change. And she really said, our house is on fire. She made the statement that we are really directly affected. And of course, it's clear the young generation is, is really affected. We have to do all the economical changes today to survive on the long term. And the young generation is also personally with their health and their living and their living conditions in nature directly affected. So it's natural that this now is the point where there is no way to return. And Greta generated a great movement in the young population. You all know about Fridays for Future and after the Fridays for Future we also had the Scientists for Future and all the other groups which work for the future with an emphasis on doing something against climate change and against the extinction of our biodiversity just to keep our civilization going for the rest of the lifetime of these people and for the next hundreds of years. With that I want to finish this lecture about climate change and climate change deniers and from now on for the rest of the lectures we will work on measures how to get rid of fossil fuels, so how to change our world to a more renewable world. But we will go beyond that and I will try to explain also how you can reduce the amount of CO2 which is in our atmosphere today. So thank you for listening to this rather long lecture today and next time I promise to be short again. Goodbye. <laughs>